No, I'm just... Ah, there we go. Okay. 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 Good evening. Thank you very much for everybody for coming. Um, I'd just like to introduce myself. My name is Ed Bottoms. Um, I run the archives at the AA here. Um, and this is really first in a series of three talks, um, three AA collections talks, uh, to be held this term. Um, these talks are really at which we invite academics um, to come and share some of their research um, and to discuss pertinent issues or objects which they've considered whilst researching um, in some of the AA's diverse collections, so in the library, the archives, or the photo library. So my job is to introduce Mara Thornton, who's here to, for the, our speaker tonight. Um, Amara completed her PhD just up the road at UCL um, in 2011, I think, yep. Um, her thesis examined the role of um, intellectual and social networks um, at play um, during the professionalization of archaeology from about the 1870s up until the, the Second World War. Um, and then just last year, she completed um, British Academy-funded postdoc fellowship, also at UCL Institute of Archaeology, um, a project looking at archaeology, publishing, and the construction of identity. Um, she's currently an honorary research associate at the department um, and is coordinator of the History of Archaeology Network, also run at UCL. Also, as if you're not busy enough, um, she's principal investigator um, in an inter interdisciplinary digitalization project um, called Filming Antiquity, which makes available, analyzes, and curates an extraordinary collection of excavation footage primarily from the 1930s British Mandate, Palestine. Now, I met Amara last August when she approached the archives um, looking for information on an archaeologist um, called Ralph Lavers, who had studied here in the 19, 1920s. 1920s. Um, and it became clear, really, as, as Amara was digging deeper in the archives, so to speak, um, that more and more layers of AA graduates were being unearthed. Um, who had actually gone on to make prominent careers um, as archaeologists. And indeed, this peculiar kind of symbiotic, symbiotic relationship between architects and archaeologists is a subject for Amara's talk um, tonight. Um, she's going to address this relationship. Um, her talk is entitled, as you can see, Supplying the Third Dimension. Um, I hope you're willing to take some questions afterwards. Yep, there's going to be some uh, wine, some drink um, afterwards, so please do stay, hang around. Um, we've also got some material out from the collections, um, which some of it will be relevant, hopefully, to the talk, um, some of which Mara has also brought herself. Um, so if, without further ado, if I can pass you over. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, it is absolutely a pleasure to be here this evening. Um, I've been researching architects and archaeology for a long time, um, and it was really a joy to be able to investigate that history and the Architectural Association's role in that history um, last summer with Ed. Um, and I'll see, you'll see some of the um, things that we were able to um, identify that were relevant to this history in my presentation. And also I've brought some other things that are relevant to some of the architects that I'll be talking about. So um, obviously the history of architecture and archeology span is a lengthy one. Um, and I'm only gonna be able to talk about some of the architects that were involved, um, but I hope I can start to make uh, the contributions of these men and women um, more visible. So I'm starting this presentation <clears throat> with a quote from architect and archaeologist Seton Lloyd. Um, his words, I think, capture a sense of the importance of architecture and architects to archaeology. As Lloyd observes, as you'll see in the quote, um, architects' ability to construct a vision of the past draws on their knowledge of buildings, space, and perspective to give a three-dimensional structure on which to hang archaeological interpretation. <clears throat> so my talk is going to focus on the 20th century um, because that's the period that I have the most um, research in. Um, but I'm actually going to begin in the late 19th century. Um, and there were a number of routes for architects in that period to become involved in archaeology. One was through study. <clears throat> Another was through employment. 
um, and in surveying and planning sites. And a third, um, which is quite important, is through the administration and preservation, and in some cases, reconstruction of archaeological sites um, because the architects involved were employed as um, inspectors or directors of antiquities services and departments. So I'm going to introduce to you some of the architects who took these various roles. And as my research focuses on British archaeological activity in the Eastern Mediterranean and Middle East, I'll be focusing on the architects who are working in those areas. So I'm starting um, in Athens. Uh, this is the British School of Athens. Um, some of you might know the British School of Athens. It was established in 1886. I mean, from its early days, it had a really strong relationship with the Royal Institute of British Architects. So archaeological studentships enabled um, architects to go to Greece and pursue their studies among the region's ancient monuments, and they could also there interact with archaeologists who were coming to excavate and explore as well. Um, one of the things that the students did was to provide new buildings for the school. Um, they designed a hostel for the school, which was built in 1895. And um, some of them later went on to have a great impact on architectural practice um, outside of archaeology in um, various regions. Um, a couple of architects from the British School Athens Byzantine Research Fund, for example, went on to work as architects in Sudan. And Robin Cormack has written about those architects recently, so it's worth checking um, his work out. I've awkwardly not stapled my talk, so <laughs> this could be interesting. Um, so this uh, excerpt from the British School's uh, annual describes the construction of the British School's building um, by the school's first director and president, um, Francis, uh, president, sorry, of the RIBA, Francis Penrose. So it gives you an idea of the school's community, a place essentially where different disciplines and professions could come together. Um, now we're moving to Egypt. Um, so Egypt was occupied by Britain um, in 1882. And Egypt already had um, an extant British expat community, but from the occupation, this became a more formally um, a political community as well. British officials began to work in key government departments and serve um, on influential committees. One of the most relevant organizations for archaeology and architecture in Egypt was the Egyptian Antiquity Service, um, which was re-established actually in the 1850s, and it had British inspectors um, from the 1890s, for, sorry, from 1899 more specifically. Um, there was also a short-lived London-based Society for the Preservation of the Monuments of Ancient Egypt, quite a long title, which was um, headed up by the artist Edward Pointer. Um, the Egypt Exploration Fund, which is also in London, was founded in 1882 to provide financial support for research, excavation, and survey in Egypt. And many people associated with the EEF um, were also associated with the Society for the Preservation of the Monuments of Ancient Egypt. <laughs> and there's no way to shorten that. So, um, anyway, <clears throat> one of the first things um, the Society did was to campaign for an inspectorate of ancient monuments to be appointed in order to ensure that um, sites were not damaged either by the communities living around them or by tourists who wanted to take bits of the sites away with them. Um, eventually, this inspectorate was responsible for ensuring adequate infrastructure for preservation, research, and tourism. And that included um, installing guardians at sites, fencing off newly uncovered remains to preserve things in situ, and also navigating tourist access to the sites. Um, I'll come back to antiquities inspectors a bit more later on. Um, but one of the expats living in Egypt during this sort of late 19th century period was a Brighton-born architect called Summers Clark. And Summers Clark had established himself in the UK as an ecclesiastical architect, mainly, um, in, um, between the 1870s and the 1890s. 
However, um, Nicholas Warner has done a, a huge amount of work on Summers Clark, and he has charted particularly Clark's, um, what he calls a parallel life in Egypt from the 1890s onwards. And Clark actually died in Egypt in the 1920s, so he was um, well established in the country. So <clears throat> Clark began his archeological life at a site called El Kab, um, which uh, has tombs that are cut into the rock and the remains of temples um, built by a succession of Egyptian pharaohs. Um, and over su successive seasons at El Kab, Clark worked in a team comprised of a young civil, civil engineer called John, Joseph John Tyler and a photographer called um, Harold Roller and some other people um, who were just there for one season or two seasons. Um, Clark's role at El Cobb was to play on the temples and describe and um, chart the wall paintings on the site. Their work, um, his and Roller's and um, Tyler's, was displayed initially at the Society of Antiquaries of London in 1893, where the display was open for a few days in November that year for the public to examine. And it was later published in very, very large volumes. Um, so I think the volumes are about that big. So um, it gives you a nice idea of the scale. Um, so they continued working at this site for several more seasons. And another architect joined the team, um, a Royal Academy Schools trained um, man called Ernest Tatum Richmond. Um, he joined uh, the El Cobb excavations in 1895, and you'll hear more about Richmond later. Um, so the findings were also noted in tour guides to Egypt. So, for example, um, Cook's steamers would give their um, give the people who were going on tours down the Nile with Cook's a book called um, The Nile Notes for Travelers in Egypt, which was written by Wallace Budge, who was a curator at the British Museum. And uh, this book basically described sites going um, up the Nile successively. So when you get to El Cobb, um, what you read is, in the winter of 1892 to three, Mr. Summers Clark and Mr. J.J. Tyler examined and described in an exhaustive manner many of the buildings at El Cobb. And the results of their work were published, and then it gives you the reference. So essentially, the architects are becoming part of the tourist experience as they're going down the Nile. And that would have been reflected in other tour guides as well. So um, this is just an example of one of the um, illustrations from the El Cobb volumes. This is, you can see on, well, it's probably too small, but on the left, it says, is that left? It says Summers Clark. And then on the right, it's, um, I think that says Summers Clark and Howard Carter, who's obviously the um, artist, actually, who later becomes an excavator who um, uncovers King Tut's tomb. Um, so, in 1894, a plan circulated from the Egyptian government for the construction of the Aswan Dam to aid the collection of water for use in irrigation in Egypt. The Society for the Preservation of the Monuments of Ancient Egypt um, and the Society of Antiquaries of London um, campaigned ultimately unsuccessfully um, for this plan to be abandoned uh, because uh, the, the dam's proposed location near the first cataract of the Nile meant that the temples um, on the island of Philae um, would be partially underwater for part of the year. Summers Clark was a vocal advocate for the preservation of Philae and the other ancient monuments that would be affected by this proposal, making a case against the construction of the dam um, in the early stages of the planning process. Um, one of the interesting things that I discovered when I was putting together this presentation was actually when Summers Clark was making his um, statements about how uh, this, the construction of the dam would be um, detrimental to archaeology. One of the other things he commented on was that 25,000 people lived um, in sites that would be affected by this plan. Um, and he was asking where they should be housed <laughs> if the plans were to come um, to fruition. 
So ultimately, um, the plans did come to fruition, but I've included at the top of this slide um, uh, the report, the memorial from the Society for the Preservation of um, the Monuments of Ancient Egypt in 1894. They sent this sort of plea to the technical commission um, saying, please don't, um, please consider that you're actually going to be um, damaging some really important stuff if you go through with these plans. Um, and the bottom, sorry, the middle um, illustration, which is a color illustration, um, shows the level of the Nile where the red arrow is when the floods, um, when the, the water in the dam is at its highest at that point. And this can be seen more effectively um, in this slide where you see on the top, this is um, Philae, the Temple of Isis, um, when the water is low. And at the bottom is the Temple of Isis when the water is high. And um, there's a very interesting um, report that was published, um, which the illustration in the middle of the last slide comes from, um, which was put together in 1907 um, in order to report on the damage that had been done or to survey the um, temples of Philae um, at that moment in time when the flooding had been going on for a couple of years. Um, and Ernest Richmond, who I mentioned earlier with Summers Clark, um, was then working for the Department of Public Works in Egypt, and it was actually him who went to Philae to report um, for the Department of Public Works on what was going on. And there's a, a bit where he, um, they come on to comment on the fact that boats can sail quite close to the monuments and that there might be some damage that's um, happening because of that. But the report ultimately concluded that the damage wasn't significant enough for them to do anything about it. Right. So, by the early 1890s, an up-and-coming um, archaeologist called Flinders Petrie had been appointed professor of Egyptian archaeology at University College London. Among the students in his Egyptology classes in the late 1890s was the architect and designer Hugh Stannis. Um, Stannis had studied architecture at the Royal Academy schools and then become an associate and a fellow of the Royal Institute of British Architects in the 1870s. Stannis was a specialist in applied art and decorative art, um, and he was one of um, what was called the 15, which was a group that included Walter Crane and Henry Holliday, um, and was sort of championing the arts and crafts at that, in the early 1880s. But in the 1890s, Stannis was lecturing in applied art at the Slade, um, and he's listed in UCL's session fees books um, as an Egyptology student between 1894 and 1898, and again between 1902 and 1908. So quite a significant um, amount of time spent studying Egyptian archaeology. Um, in 1902, <clears throat> he joined Flinders Petrie's excavations at Abydos, um, where he was um, to plan the temple of Ramses II, which you see pictured here. And you can see um, in the top quote, which is from um, the ultimate Abydos publication, um, where Petrie has acknowledged Hugh Stannis's um, work at the site. And then the bottom quote is from a very interesting um, letter that Petrie sent to the editor of Architecture, responding to some criticisms that had um, been published about architects and archaeology, um, among other things. And um, so, um, Petrie is pointing out, surely the work of Hugh Stannis should be remembered at Bydos. Um, and um, Petrie has also given us some details about Hugh Stannis's work, 5,000 measurements of the plans of 10 successive temple foundations, so quite a lot of material there. Unfortunately, Stannis died before the publication could be um, fully completed, and Margaret Murray I think had the task of pulling together all of his, um, all of his uh, notes, but he was there, and Petrie acknowledged the fact 
Um, he also gave a lecture on Egyptian archaeology to members of the Architectural Association in uh, February 1904. So maybe that will be something that we can investigate a bit further um, in due course. But um, among other things, it explores ideas of how the geography of Egypt were represented I mean, it's decorative architecture. So obviously, alongside doing these plans, he was making notes about the, decoration, the decorative um, elements of the sites that he was looking at at Abydos and feeding them back into the architectural community. So, architectural planning, obviously, is a key part of, um, ar of archaeological um, interpretation. And this is um, Walter Sykes George. Um, and Walter Sykes George was a student at the British School of Athens um, in the early part of the 20th century. He was a member of the Byzantine Research Fund. Um, and at Meroe in Sudan, this particular site, um, there was a lot of buildings that needed to be recorded. And uh, George was there to provide architectural expertise. So George's um, architectural expertise was incorporated into the annual exhibitions um, that the site's excavator, John Garstang, put together in London at the Society of Antiquaries to showcase the results of each season. Um, it's worth pointing out that these, um, ex these exhibitions that Garstang put together were quite well attended and by <coughs> very significant um, members of London society at the time. So Queen Victoria showed up at one of these um, and um, a lot of other sort of notable guests came along. Um, so George, um, in this particular excavation, um, exhibition, his site of, his plan of Meroe, I'm sorry for the photograph, but it's the best I could do. Um, his plan of the Royal Baths of Meroe was included as a fold out plate um, in the catalog for the 1912-1913 um, exhibition. He also wrote a section of the catalog which explained the architectural discoveries in more detail. So essentially, this um, catalog costs sixpence. So essentially, this is a, a very affordable way for people to understand the architectural context of the site um, and have a little take home um, to remember the exhibition and the site and its architecture. So um, George ended up continuing on in architecture rather than archaeology. Um, during the war, he moved to um, India, where he started working for Ed Edwin Lutyens um, in New Delhi, and he stayed in New Delhi um, and for the rest of his career. Um, so we're moving on to post-war. Now, oops. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to start this section of the talk by highlighting two women archaeologists, uh, sorry, architects, whose work were included in the uh, interpretation of archaeological sites during the 1920s. Um, so Liverpool-educated architect Eunice Holliday was a young newlywed when she and her husband who was also an architect called Clifford Holliday, moved to Jerusalem so that Clifford Holliday could begin work in the public works department in Mandate, Palestine. In their first few weeks in the city, the couple stayed with John Garstang, who we met earlier, um, who at that point was director of the British School of Archaeology in Jerusalem, <coughs> which was a new um, sister school for the British School of Athens and the British School of Rome. Um, but also the director of the Palestine um, Antiquities Department. So he had quite an important role in the city at that point. Um, so Eunice Holliday was very interested in archaeology, and uh, because she was living in Garstang's house, um, Garstang got her to do some drawings for him um, of a site called Tel, Harba Tel Harbaj, um, which is in Palestine. It was one of the sites that the British school students were then um, excavating. So um, her plan for this site was published in the school's bulletin in 1922. 
Um, in the late 1920s, uh, an another architect called Dorothy Norrie um, was uh, taken out by an, ar an archaeologist called Gertrude Caton Thompson, who's quite famous. Um, and they went to a site called Great Zimbabwe, which I think probably most people have heard of. Um, and uh, Dorothy Norrie was trained at the Bartlett School of Architecture um, and was employed by Gertrude Caton Thompson to trace uh, the history of the ruins at Great Zimbabwe, along with um, another famous archaeologist called Kathleen Kenyon, who um, went on to do great things in um, many different places, but also um, she excavated in Jerusalem and in Jericho in the 1950s and 60s. So um, this was Kathleen Kenyon's first dig. And Dorothy Nori, I haven't found anything out about except that she was on this dig. And um, Gertrude Caton Thompson wasn't that flattering about Nori, sadly. Um, she was very impressed with her to begin with, and then I think her affections, as it were, turned more to Kathleen Kenyon. But regardless, in the publication of um, Gertrude, Gertrude Caton Thompson's ex ex excavations, um, uh, Dorothy Nori's drawings are featured. <coughs> so you can see those on the slide. There was also an exhibition of the Great Zimbabwe findings, but I couldn't find any evidence that Nori's illustrations were included. That doesn't mean that they weren't. They just weren't noted in reviews of the exhibition. Um, they probably were there, but I can't find any evidence. Right, so we're going to stick with Mandate Palestine. But this is an architect called George Horsfield. Um, George Horsfield was actually the person who got me interested in architecture and archaeology um, because it was his and his wife's um, archive that began my PhD research. So I feel quite, um, I, you know, I feel quite excited about George Horsfield. And I've been researching him for a long time, so um, he is one of my favorite architects in archaeology. Um, he was one of the early uh, British, school, uh, British school in Jerusalem students. Um, and he was admitted specifically because he had an architectural background. Um, he was trained under uh, George Frederick, Frederick Bodley in London. And as a young man, after um, leaving Bodley's office, he moved to New York to work for a very famous um, neo-Gothic architectural firm uh, called Graham, Cram, Goodhue, and Ferguson. And he worked specifically for um, uh, Bertram Grosner Goodhue, who was a partner in the firm, in the New York office. Um, and he, while he was there, <coughs> he made two um, illustrations for architectural record, front cover illustrations. Um, it's very small, but just underneath, uh, just above the U and R in architectural, is, um, is his signature, which is Wilberforce Horsefield. He, that was, his middle name is Wilberforce. So um, this is his uh, commemoration of the building of the Liverpool Cathedral. Um, and in the, the 1912 issue of Architectural Record, um, which he also provided the front cover illustration for, um, is an article by him about the building of the Lady Chapel in the Liverpool Cathedral. Um, so this was his sort of pre-war architectural um, heyday, as, um, as it were. Um, after the war, he, went, he joined up, he got trench fever, he was sent back to the UK, and then he moved to India for a while, and then found himself in Mandate Palestine in 1923, and um, decided to move into archaeology. So um, he joins the British School of Archaeology in Jerusalem, and among um, other things, he makes a plan of one of the um, school's excavations at Tantura. Um, but then he moves fairly quickly to a position in Transjordan, which is now modern Jordan, um, where he was uh, tasked, essentially, with beginning to clear and excavate and partially reconstruct um, one of the most famous uh, Roman cities in Jordan, which is Jerash. Um, partly in order to ensure that the site would be accessible for tourists, um, but also to begin sort of archaeological um, work as a trained archaeologist. 
His position eventually became more formalized, um, and he um, was given the title of Chief Inspector of Antiquities in Transjordan in the Antiquities Department. And essentially, he was um, the British official um, in working in the Transjordan Antiquities Department, and he held that role until 1936. In a related side note, our old friend Ernest Richmond um, became Garstang's successor in the Department of Antiquities in Palestine um, and overlapped with Horsfield um, by nearly a decade. Um, so you can see the architects who are um, infiltrating into the Antiquities Inspectorate um, here. So this postcard, which was the um, the, um, the postcard, the image that I wanted to go with this talk in publicity is um, from Horsfield's archive at the Institute of Archaeology. And um, it's one of my favorite images uh, because essentially Horsfield's vision of the past is sketched right on top of an image of one of the site's um, most prominent features. Um, and George Horsfield has been dead for 60 years I mean, this postcard is a rather lovely, haunting reminder of his relationship with Jarash in particular, um, and its past, its present, his present, um, and its future, because uh, Jarash is still open now as a as tourist attraction. Um, the Propylia of Artemis was actually just um, below his house, which is right in the middle of the site. So he would have seen um, the back end of this particular um, part of the site every morning when he left his house. Um, I don't know when this sketch was done, but I think it adds a nice new dimension and a vigor uh, to the remains that you see. Um, it also um, is an ephemeral item that came out of Jarash, so because it's a postcard and that's being put out by the Department of Antiquities, which is um, the department that Horsfield was working for, and it's dated, it says um, 1925 on the date there. So I think it symbolizes quite a lot of the issues that I wanted to bring up in this talk this evening. So Horsfield also built the first museum at Jarash, um, and you can see it here in this photograph from the Horsfield archive at UCL. So this is we, this is right in the middle of the site, basically. Um, I think that's the Temple of Artemis in the background there. But this is essentially just a gallery for um, the bits of um, inscriptions and things that Horsfield was finding when he was um, pulling stuff around for um, doing the excavations that he was doing, the small-scale excavations that he was doing at Jarash. Um, <clears throat> one of the other things that Horsfield got up to um, during this time period was um, conducting the first scientific excavations at Petra. And Agnes Conway, um, who joined the excavations at Petra that Horsfield was doing to conduct her own research, um, noted his ability to pick up details that she had missed when she was going around the site looking for places of sacrifice, which was her particular research question. So she wrote in her diary, I can take Mr. H afterwards straight to the places which puzzle me, and he can interpret and see more. He is first rate on the spot and found a moon niche today and two inscriptions that I had never noticed. Um, later on, they ended up getting married and they lived, <laughs> they lived in Jarash until 1936 uh, when Horsfield resigned his post. Um, and then they sort of traveled around a bit and then moved back to the UK. Um, but then Horsfield actually ended up moving to Cyprus after um, Agnes died, and he was very good friends with the, um, an architect who built the Palestine Archaeological Museum, what's now the Rockefeller Museum in Jerusalem. And that architect was a man named Austin Harrison. Um, and Austin Harrison was living in Cyprus at the time. So Horsfield went to join his buddy, uh, Austin Harrison, in Cyprus, and then died in Cyprus in 1956. So. Um, he went back to his arch arch architectural roots, you might say. So another um, ancient city that was being excavated in Mandate Palestine at a time 
in the 1930s um, was a site called Tel Duir. Um, this was supposed to be a biblical uh, Lachish, which is a city that endured many um, invasions from forces um, in the ancient, it's mentioned in the Bible in several different uh, occasions um, with various people coming in. Assyrians, I think, are the chief um, protagonists. But uh, anyway, the, this was the site where um, a young South African architect called Herbert Hastings McWilliams um, had the opportunity to display and um, create his own vision of the past, which you see here. So McWilliams' work, like other um, architect archaeologists before him and after him, was featured in the exhibition um, that followed each season of, um, at Lake Ish. So this drawing um, had many different um, lives, as it were. So it was featured in the exhibition, um, for one. It also featured in a film that was made of uh, the excavations at Taljweer, um, made by the excavation photographer. And it was published in the Illustrated London News um, in a report on the excavations in May 1935. Um, interestingly, it also features in a book called The Diabolical, which um, Herbert Hastings McWilliams wrote, um, following a remarkable journey by car which was specifically modified to McWilliams' designs, um, which carried he, him and um, a couple of other people from the Tel Jawir dig um, from Palestine to London, overland, and by channel. Um, so um, this book is quite an interesting um, compilation of different things. It's a travel log, but it, it's also meant to be um, a guide for people who want to undertake the same journey. So um, Herbert Hastings McWilliams' um, drawings of the car and all of the modifications he made is included, and then a list of supplies, quite a lengthy list of supplies listed in the back. So I recommend it as a, a read for anyone who's interested in automotive travel logs. Um, so, I want to focus now more specifically on a group of architects who were trained here at the Architectural Association. They all went through the um, AA in the 1920s, 1930s, I think, um, and went on to be involved in archaeology, some of them for quite a significant portion of their working lives. So I had a wonderful day last August in the archives um, with Ed investigating some of these men. Um, and uh, among the items that Ed showed me was this program from the 1926 Architectural Association pantomime, Cylinderella. Um, and there were two architectural students that I'd already come across in my research, um, Ralph Lavers and Hilary Waddington, who were both involved in this production. Um, both Waddington and Lavers became architects for the Egypt Exploration Society, which was the post-war version of the Egypt Exploration Fund that I mentioned earlier. Um, so both of them were employed as architects for the EES's excavation at Tel El Amarna, which was the city where um, the pharaoh Akhenaten uh, moved uh, the capital of Egypt to uh, Amarna uh, during his reign. And he was married to Queen Nefertiti, who's obviously someone that most people will have heard of, I think. And there were many varied buildings in this ancient city. So in a sense, Amarna was something of an architect's uh, paradise or hell, if um, you look at it in different ways, because it was co quite a complicated city. So um, there was a woman called um, Mary Chubb at the site at Amarna. And she wrote a memoir, which I'll um, come back to later, but both Lavers and Waddington feature in Mary Chubb's memoir. So I recommend it as a, um, as a, a nice read. Um, Hilary Waddington was a cameraman also, as well as being an architect on site. Um, and his films of the Amarna excavations were shown in conjunction with the annual exhibition of artifacts 
from Amarna. The EES has now digitized this film and sequences, sequences of it, um, sequences from it, I should say, feature in a two-part documentary which is on the Society's YouTube channel. Um, you can see more highlights from the archive in these films. So um, part of it is sequences from the film, but also it's interspersed with um, narrated, uh, narration from the EES director and some oral interviews from two women who worked at Amarna um, alongside the DIG director, John Pendlebury. Um, so <clears throat> alongside the filming, um, Waddington contributed to the public face of the exhibitions through designing promotional materials and advertising, um, incorporating the site plans and drawings based on the artifacts and, and artwork into his work. So uh, it might be a bit difficult to see, but this is a sort of draft for an, a poster for the underground advertising the Amarna exhibition, um, which the Egypt Exploration Society has recently gotten a bit um, donation from the Waddington family, and I think this was part of it. But you can see the plan underneath the text um, there. Um, what, among the other bits of archive that came in with this donation were the original clapperboard for the film and some of the intertitles, um, which were just held up. It was quite a sort of um, amateur affair, but quite effective. So Waddington also uh, worked in Mandate Palestine in the 1930s, helping um, our old friend Ernest Richmond um, at the Antiquities Department. And then in 1937, he went on to work for the Archaeological Survey of India. Um, so he maintained his link with archaeology for quite a long time. Um, <clears throat> Ralph Lavers, who I mentioned, um, was uh, in Cylinderella with Hillary Waddington, um, organized the EES's annual exhibition of results from Amarna in 1933. And that particular display was held here at the Architectural Association, although um, Ed and I have yet to figure out which room it was in, um, if indeed it was in any room in particular. Um, he reviewed the display for the Architectural Association journal and um, a copy of his review is out on the table. Um, and you can see um, here that um, there are other Architectural Association students who are featured in the exhibition. And in his review, Labors gives us an idea of who those architects are. Um, just as an aside, this is um, an, an sort of publicity promotional material um, that Labors designed for the exhibition. Um, and it's very small, but between the knee and the foot of the figure is Labors' name. Um, so, <clears throat> so he um, tells us in his review um, that the majority of architectural work shown in the exhibition has been done by three past AA students. Seton Lloyd, who I started my presentation with, um, H.W. Waddington, and the present writer. In this connection, it may be noted that another AA man, J.C. Rose, has for several seasons been working with Mr. C. Leonard Woolley at Ur. The drawings include typical plans of the houses, palaces, and temples, portions of the town, planning, and various reconstructions. Um, one of the other things that Labors notes um, in this particular review is that um, there are photographs on display of a model of a typical Amarna house. And he says, um, several years of in intensive research were necessary before this model could be made. And although some architects have expressed astonishment at the apparently modern lines of the design, it is definitely an authentic representation in every detail of the house of a wealthy person of the period. Perhaps these architects, he says, would be still more astonished to learn that a modern system of hollow wall construction was employed in building such a house. So 
Um, this just gives you an idea of one of the reconstruction sketches that Lavers um, made of Amarna. And on the table, there's um, another two re reconstruction sketches that Lavers um, did for the Illustrated London News. So you can have a look at those at the end. Um, this, I mentioned Mary Chubb, who was at Amarna. Mary Chubb published Nefertiti Lived Here, which is her um, memoir of her time at Amarna in the 1950s. And Ralph Lavers did the illustrations for her. So here he is commemorating his own work at the site in this illustration. And actually, this is part of... Um, Part of a page. So in this particular page at the bottom left-hand corner, you see this figure um, doing his surveying. And then at the top right-hand corner is a little figure in the distance um, with uh, a, holding up a stick showing the, the sort of process of surveying across the page. So it's quite a clever illustration. Um, he also labors, illustrated archaeological books for younger readers, and moving into the 1950s and 1960s. Um, he uh, reached, he was reaching out essentially to a new generation of school children at this point. Um, so among the books that he illustrated were some volumes of Oxford University Press's Peoples of the Past series, which essentially are sort of fictionalized um, short pamphlets that introduce key time periods in British history um, through narratives. And so Lavers is occasionally illustrating um, archaeological work that, that have been done at the sites that are being represented in these books, but also um, giving you illustrations that tell the story of this sort of fictional character. Um, I've also brought with me a copy of a book called um, A Portrait of Britain Before 1066 which was also illustrated by Lavers. You can have a look at it at the end, but this is in the frontispiece of um, that particular volume, and it's Lavers' um, illustrated timeline, which I think is quite an effective way to communicate um, archaeology through objects and um, illustrations. You can get a sense of, I think, of Lavers' sort of personality through these illustrations as well. So <clears throat> I'm sure that Agatha Christie is familiar to some, if not all of you. Um, she is the link between the final set of architects that I'm going to, I'm going to introduce briefly today. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, John Crookshank Rose, Robin Halliday McCartney, and Seton Lloyd as the person who brings it all to a close. Um, you might remember um, John Rose's name being mentioned in Ralph Lavers' write-up of the Amarna exhibition that I showed you earlier. Christie's husband, Max Malowin, um, first met John Rose at Ur in 1925, um, where, Ur, uh, where Rose, um, who he called a beautiful draftsman, um, so Malone recorded, made an invaluable contribution by disentangling the complex strands of brickwork in the ziggurat, a building which had experienced the most intricate alter alterations over a long period of time. So uh, Rose and Malone became very good friends. And when Malone, who by that point was married to Agatha Christie, began conducting his own excavations at Tel Arpaccia, which is near Mosul, Rose came along too. Um, and there, Malowin recalled in his memoir, his eyes were hardly ever raised from the drawing board. Um, so after Tel Arpachia, Tel Arpachia came Chagar Bazar in Syria in 1934. Um, Robin McCartney, um, who I love this description that of Rob McCartney, that's in Max Mello's memoir. He says, McCartney has a cast iron stomach and few words. Um, so Rob McCartney, with his cast iron stomach, was part of the team 
and later on, John Rose joined as well. And um, Max Mellon explains the recruitment process that he went through um, in his memoir, which I think you'll find particularly relevant. He says, I made it my practice to go to the Architectural Association in order to induce some young architect who had just completed his training to come out for a period of some months to the east at our expense for the joy of the trip and for a holiday of a kind which he would never experience again. Sounds pretty, sounds pretty good. <laughs> so McCartney, or Mac, as Christie called him, um, was almost impenetrably shy. And she um, talks quite a lot about Mac in her memoir, Come Tell Me How You Live. So I recommend that if you want to get a sense of Mac's personality. Um, they first met in Beirut, en, en route to um, Shagar. And as Christie was also quite shy, this made for an awkward uh, beginning. But eventually they got over it and um, they became very good friends. Um, so initially, um, Mallowin wasn't quite as enthusiastic over McCartney's abilities on site as he had been with Rose. So if you read his memoir, he kind of is a bit ambivalent about McCartney at the beginning. But eventually, um, they become quite good friends. And um, McCartney stayed for all the seasons at Shagar. Um, and he's commemorated in Christie's memoir, as I said, of her experiences there, which is, um, come tell me how you live. He also built the dig house at Shagar, and that's something that I haven't really touched on, um, but there are quite a lot of architects who are involved in the construction of dig houses during ar uh, archeological excavations. That's a sort of whole other project, but I just wanted to flag up that that was something that architects were expected to do. And um, not just dig houses, but also it meant laying the drains and the pipes and all of the sort of infrastructure for the domestic side of the dig. Um, so, um, John McCartney, sorry, Robin McCartney, um, went on to do four uh, dust covers for Agatha Christie's novels. Um, so, in a sense, he's kind of contributing to the way that the public access archaeology, even if it's just through Agatha Christie's novels. Um, because the four of the four books that he illustrated dust covers for, um, they include Murder in Mesopotamia, Death on the Nile, and Appointment with Death, all of which um, have links to archaeology. I mean, obviously, Murder in Mesopotamia is the one that takes place on an archaeological site, um, but the other ones have archaeology sort of lingering in the background. Um, the other one that he illustrates is Murder in the Muse, if anyone's interested. Um, but I've brought with me a book um, where you can see some of McCartney's dust jackets for those books. Um, so do have a look at those later. John Rose, meanwhile, supplied illustrations for um, IES Edwards' um, Pyramids of Egypt, a copy of which is also on the table for you to look at. Um, John Rose went on to become an architect um, in the West Indies, um, where Agatha Christie and Max Malone visited him. Uh, and Christie's Caribbean mystery novel is dedicated to John Rose. Um, so Seton Lloyd, whom Ma Malone called a master of mud brick, it's quite a nice uh, evocative uh, description, was another colleague of Max Malone's. In the 1940s, Lloyd worked as technical advisor to the Iraq Department of Antiquities, so you can again see this, um, the way the architects are able to go into these antiquities inspectorate positions. He later became head of the British School at Ankara. So <clears throat> just to draw things to a close, um, as you will have seen, hopefully, the history of architects in archeology span in the late 19th and early 20th centuries extends far beyond merely surveying and planning ancient sites. Architects, of course, contributed important skills to the recording of buildings and structures on site, with their work featured as illustrative and interpretive contributions to site reports and formal publications. But of equal importance, I'd say, is their contribution to public physical and intellectual access to archeology. span and in a sense, it's popular um, interpretation. 
So as an antiquities inspectors or directors, architects surveyed vast regions, um, making lists of visible sites and monuments. They were also a critical part of heritage and tourism infrastructure, providing physical access and ensuring that, adequate, that sites and artifacts were adequately protected. And significantly, they enabled members of the public to understand how sites might have looked in the past in a variety of media, um, as well as exposing the process of archaeology by illustrating um, and by organizing exhibitions um, and filming. So, as Seton Lloyd noted, architects did truly supply a third dimension in more senses than one might think. Thank you. I should just say, this is a, um, a shot from one of the films that we've digitized showing the drawing office. I think it's probably at Tel Duir, if anyone's interested. Yeah, thank you very much for a fascinating talk and uh, ranging such a broad span. Um, and uh, Maybe um, if, before, before I give a chance for anyone else to ask a question, um, could I ask a question relating, um, you come up to about the 50s, 60s, you say, but um, can you talk for a little bit on the role, or in, if any role of architects have now within digs? I mean, I'm thinking certainly there's an interest. <laughs> that, I mean, there's an interest in, in architecture, certainly yeah. um, in archaeology, and um, I'm thinking of the Middle East, people like Eyal Weisenman, um, who... Um, has been looking at forensic archaeology, um, and I'm wondering if, if you know, it, in such contested spaces, are, are architects being involved in, in um, kind of in within digs or within um, uh, kind of evaluating <coughs> buildings? And uh, what, what, could you talk a little maybe about that? Well, I can try. Yeah. This is the modern the modern part. The contemporary context isn't. Um, is my strong point, but I would say that um, the difference between now and the period that I'm talking about is that um, now you get a little bit of architectural skill coming through within archaeology degrees. So it's there's less need for a um, particularly specialist architectural element coming through in archaeological digs. Also, it's ex more expensive. <laughs> and money is always tight. Um, but I think that um, in the earlier period, um, this was a way for architects to expand their own architectural experience. And then most of them, you know, went off and did their own architectural things. But um, there was also an opportunity for architects um, to get involved in the management of archaeological um, sites, which is not there now because the context, the political context has completely changed. Mm -hmm. So um, I would say that the architects who got involved in the antiquities inspectorates, mm -hmm. um, they were, I think, seen as, as particularly able to do those kinds of roles. I mean, not all antiquities inspectors were architects, but um, the ones who were in charge uh, often the people who are in charge of recruiting them had an eye out for architects who had archaeological know-how. So um, I think the context has now yeah. changed. Yeah, it's so, part of professionalization. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. So this is a period when they're still trying to work out how they train people, and, that, and you get the British schools abroad, which um, are feeding um, architects into archaeological context in a, in a, in a more... Um, vigorous way, I suppose, than they are yeah. now. I guess I'm just interested in the kind of reconstruction, um, which is, I guess, is a kind of a slightly maybe contested issue yes. as well. <laughs> and, and whether architects bring a different skill or a different approach than to somebody who has not studied for five years or, you know, from a different background. And what, if there are any issues there that are... I think even in, the, even in that period, there were issues with yeah. the way the architects reconstructed yeah. things. Like yeah. um, Pete Dijon in, at Knossos, I think he was an architect. Yeah. Um, and he was the one who was behind the reconstruction of 
hypnosis in the 1920s, which is obviously quite problematic yeah. for many people. Yes, yeah. um, so I think even in the 1920s, they're a bit kind of wary of um, putting something into concrete, <laughs> as it were. But yeah, the, the contemporary context is out of, mostly out of my knowledge area, but um, I would say that um, it's more archaeologists who are doing reconstructions yeah. now, um, with digital, particularly with digital reconstructions. Um, I think, yeah, it's 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 part of the archaeological, mm -hmm. more a part of the archaeological training than it was in this period. I would say. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, so I have a question that kind of goes along with your question, but I feel like there isn't, I don't, I'm not sure if there is like a critical approach from your side about the very particular way of reconstructing and even approaching archaeology. And especially, well not especially, but it's not just in like contemporary way that there is contested political mm. things underground. I mean, there's always been archaeology from my knowledge in Jerusalem and in Palestine, um, a very selective layering. So sure. you choose a layer, and that's what you built upon. Yeah. yeah. Um, you re. I mean, and I'm from Israel, so that's why I'm extremely critical and aware of these things and how mm. subjective history can be built from that. But I'm just wondering if you encountered any any questions or people that have seen a site and have selected. Like, how is the selection process of reconstruction up to which layer of history yeah. do you choose to reconstruct? Because, well, after 48 in Israel, it was very clear which layer you reconstruct because there is um, a resurrection of the Israelites now. So that's yeah. why that's what you would construct. But before that, under the British mandate or the Ottoman Empire, yeah. has there ever been a conflict with people that they discussed into what to build because this is things that I'm very interested in so I was wondering if you ran into these these questions um, yeah I think that um, the reconstructions are well for take tell to for example Herbert Hastings Williams was only on site for one season so they were only so far in the dig at that point um, and and I don't know enough about the sort of the ancient history of the site to be able to judge whether or not his uh, reconstruction is accurate. But I would say that um, I think for the purposes of, if you're looking at how this, that particular reconstruction drawing was um, done in that particular season, the dig was funded by um, someone who was quite overtly um, evangelical Christian, so um, that obviously will have, will affect the way that um, McWilliams reconstructed the site, because he's reconstructing b the biblical city of Lachish um, in his reconstruction, so I think that that element comes in at that particular moment, because they were searching on that site for that city, um, and they were, you know, obviously when they're going down into the tell of the site, they're coming through different layers and they're uncovering the history of the site in different layers. But if you look at the context of how that site is being um, interpreted and McWilliams' reconstruction drawing is part of that, it's the, the sort of biblical element that is the most <coughs> prominent. Does that help? Well, biblical is very vast. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Looking for a biblical city can be um, many different Sure. It's like saying antiquity can be um, Byzantine or Roman or Greek, but I mean, it's really wide. But I think, I mean, if we say that the funding came from a particular church, then that maybe answers, it starts to be like a commodified um, heritage, like a piece of heritage. So maybe that's more clear, I think. Maybe. Right, th thank you. Um, 
Yes, very wide-ranging. I, I was just taking me back to my days at the Institute of Archaeology and just thinking what um, techniques we were taught that sort of overlap with architectural techniques. I just remember Mr. Stewart, who taught us drawing. Um, he uh, taught us how to do isometric drawings, which I presume is sort of like, uh, uh, an architectural skill. And, um, yeah, sort of being given sort of plans from the Middle East and sort of experimenting with doing th three-dimensional reconstructions sort of, the, of the superstructure. So anyway, yes, yeah, that, um, we're, we're at the same time as attending lectures by Seton Lloyd, which were, were quite astonishing, uh, sort of hearing first-hand accounts of the work he'd done. Uh, but I don't remember a great deal of sort of architectural input to the teaching other than that. I think they kind of took the elements of architectural <coughs> knowledge that they wanted and applied those to archaeology and kind of left it at that. I mean, that's my impression of how it's integrated now. I can't really hear you. I was, uh, um, I was actually interested in uh, the last comment. Um, I was wondering, so there were, there were these architects who were, who were part of the archae archaeological digs. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if the way that they drew in any way actually influenced the, or kind of um, um, uh, contributed to the way that archaeology was taught or the way it was practiced uh, at all? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, some of them did go into education. So Seton Lloyd, for, for example, was um, a professor in the Institute of Archaeology. So he would have been instrumental in um, including those elements of the practice that he felt were relevant for students to know um, into his curriculum. Um, I mean, other architects went on to do other things, but also um, each dig is, a, is essentially a training dig. Um, so when the architects were involved in those excavations, um, they were part of a team, and they are part, they're partly doing um, their surveying and the sort of technical elements, but they're also doing archaeology. I mean, it, every person on a dig has lots of different tasks, so um, while some people are there for a very specific purpose, they're often doing five or six other things. Um, so they're all, it's a community of sort of learning from each other. So they're all getting involved in various ways. I mean, I think that trickles down into the way that archaeology is taught later on, because everyone who was um, part of a dig like that would have, who went back into the academy, would have brought that experience with them. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, that's one of the reasons why um, architects are seen as so uh, particularly valuable for antiquities inspectorate jobs is because they have that, partly that management experience. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I mean, it's partly because what they're doing is marking visible remains. They need to be able to see those yeah. and to, you know, yeah. know what they're looking at in order to, you know, list them in the right way. Um, uh, but part of it is, ma is a management thing. Yeah. And very specific skills. I mean, the syllabus in 2013A would include a lot of measured drawing, so basically going out and measuring um, you know, how many bricks in a, in a, in a, in a brick course. Um, and so that attention to detail, I think, to see things that photographs can't see and to draw things that photographs can't see must have been useful. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. 
Yes, yeah, definitely. <laughs> it's fabulous. Everyone should see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd love to know if you still there. I don't know. I don't know. Um, sorry. Um, uh, the, the research that I mentioned um, was mostly relating to um, Summers Clark. And it's um, Nicholas Warner has done um, a report on Clark's, um, on dig houses in particular in Egypt that were built for different expeditions, mostly in Luxor, I think. Um, I think Clark built one of the houses, but he also does this huge amount of research about um, all of the other building projects that Clark was involved in that aren't archaeological per se, um, but his use of mud brick, particularly in um, construction of contemporary, at that point, contemporary um, buildings, which is really interesting. So it might be worth having a look at Nicholas Warner's report, um, particularly about dig houses, because there are some fantastic pictures of the dig houses um, in Luxor. Um, but I'm sorry, I don't, I can't answer your question. <laughs> I don't really have a question, but I was thinking about the period when you stopped with the Iranian history. Mm -hmm. It'd be great to see more architects involved in archaeology. I think that would be amazing. I'm not sure how the archaeologists would think about it, but yeah. Thank you very much again.